Father, we're so thankful for the relationship that we have with you and that you initiated it. You loved us so much that you gave us your son. And Lord Jesus, you loved us so much that you were willing to leave heaven and come down to this earth to pay the price for our sins on the cross so that we could be forgiven of our sins and so that broken relationship with God could be restored. We're so thankful for that. We're so thankful that we just have to think your name and you're right there. We're so thankful that those times where we don't even know how to put into words our prayers, you understand what we're praying. We're so thankful for that. We're thankful that you are our loving Heavenly Father, that you care about us, that you're interested in us, that you know what's going on in our lives. And you know the things that maybe this morning have us distracted, maybe discouraged, maybe almost defeated. Or on the other hand, those things in our lives that have us rejoicing today and very grateful today. Thank you that you know what's going on in our lives. And I pray that through this hour that we spend in your presence here together, that you would remind us of how much you love us, how much you care for us, and that our salvation is sure because of you. Lord, you've told us that we can pour out our hearts to you and cast all of our cares on you. And so we do that, Lord. You know the requests uh, from this church family. You know the needs that we have. And we lift them up to you and pray for your intervention and pray for your answers, Father. And Lord, sometimes we need patience as we pray, and I ask you to give us that. Help us, Lord, to keep trusting you even when the answer doesn't come the way we had hoped that it would. And Lord, some of our number need help with a job situation or a financial situation or maybe a family situation. Some of us, Lord, maybe need help spiritually. But whatever it is, we've come today to hear from you, to let you know just by our presence here today that we're serious about living for you. Lord, you've told us to pray for those in authority over us. We lift our nation up to you. How desperately we need your intervention. How desperately we need a return to righteousness and, and, and truth in our society. So I pray that your people would humble themselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways so that you will hear us and forgive our sins and heal our land. We do pray for those who are still in harm's way serving our nation. We lift them up to you. And for those, Lord, who simply because of their faith in you find their lives at risk, we pray your protection over them. And we pause to say thank you for the freedoms that we do still enjoy here in our nation that we're able to gather here today openly to worship you. We're so thankful that you're our provider, that everything that we have, we know it comes from you. And we give to you your tithes and our offerings as a reminder that you are our supply, as an act of faith that you're going to continue to be our supply, and as an act of gratitude for all that you've done for us. So whether we give through the week electronically or through the mail, whether we give here in the room, however and whenever we give to you, we're doing it in a heart of obedience, gratitude, and faith. So accept the gifts we bring you through Christ our Lord. As we continue our study of the life and teachings of Christ, we have come today to Luke chapter 12. We sang a couple of songs today about heaven, when the roll is called up yonder, when we all get to heaven. Uh, the songs are in a rotation. It just happened that the rotation today fits in what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we know that Jesus promised to come back to this earth. Now, there's a whole lot of theories about when and how. Uh, I will just give you what I believe. It's what I've been taught and what I believe from my study of the Scripture uh, is what the Scripture teaches. You don't have to believe like I do to get to heaven. You don't have to believe like I do to be a part of this church. Uh, our statement of faith basically says Jesus said he was going to come again. You know, we're, we'll let you all decide when and how you think that's going to be. But the, I believe that the Scripture teaches that the return of Christ will be basically in two stages. Uh, most of the time when people talk about the return of Christ or the second coming, they're actually talking about what we call the rapture. And that is when the church leaves the earth to meet the Lord in the air. It's what Jesus was talking about in John 14, 
if I go away, I will come again and receive you to myself so that where I am, you may be. It's what Paul talks about in 1 Thessalonians 4, a passage that I read at pretty much every graveside service I officiate, where he says, the dead in Christ will rise first, and we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord, we will rise to meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Uh, we call that the rapture of the church, where the church leaves the earth, meets Christ in the air to go to be in heaven. And I believe that what follows then is what you study in the book of Revelation and other passages of scripture called the tribulation period. The church is gone, the devil is loosed, and for seven years, it's a period of tribulation on this earth. At the end of that seven years, Jesus comes back to this earth with his saints, and he will actually set his feet on the Mount of Olives. There will be an earthquake, the Mount of Olives will divide, and I understand geologists who studied that area of the world say there is a fault line right down the middle of the Mount of Olives. Of course, you know, Jesus didn't need a fault line to, to cause an earthquake, but he's going to come set his feet on the Mount of Olives, and then he will set up his throne in Jerusalem and reign for that thousand years of peace that we call the millennium. That's how I understand the Bible teaching on the return of Christ. Now, I have heard all of my life that we're in the last days, that the coming of Christ is soon. In fact, in the 70s, one of the, I think probably the number one song in the Christian charts of the 70s was, Jesus is coming soon. And, uh, you know, there, there's the, all this emphasis that Jesus is coming soon. We are in the last days. I remember a preacher passionately in the late 70s as we approached the presidential election saying, I think this may be the last election we ever see. Well, obviously it wasn't. But what happens is when you hear that all of your life, it tends to just, you become numb to it. And it's what, you know, Peter says that in the last days, people are going to say, we have heard from the beginning that, you know, Christ is coming. Where is it? And so we need to make sure that we're accurate with what the Bible teaches. Now, I mean, John said these are the last days. You know, there are passages in Scripture that indicate they felt that they were in their last days. And, and the reason they felt that, I believe, is that there's no prophecies that have to be fulfilled before the rapture. And so, you know, Christ could come back at any time. And that's the distinction. When you study the teachings of the Bible, nowhere does it teach the soon return of Christ. Even though we sang today, you know, soon our pilgrimage will cease, you know. Um, but the Bible does not teach the soon return of Christ. What it teaches is the imminent return of Christ. The word imminent means he could come back at any moment. That's the teaching about the rapture. Not that it's going to be soon. It's obviously sooner than it was 10 years ago. And it's certainly sooner than it was in AD 90 or whenever, you know, John wrote. It's sooner than it's ever been. But the teaching of the scripture is consistently be ready. You don't know when it's going to happen. Christ could come back at any moment. Now, if John was in the last days, we must be in the last minutes of the last days, right? And, and, and we just need to understand what the last days are going to be like. Because all oh, you preachers always talking about the last days. Well, in your notes, and it's on the screen, is 2 Timothy chapter 3. This is the Living Bible paraphrase of what Paul tells us it's going to be like in the last days. Now, I'm not setting dates. I'm not telling you when the rapture is going to happen. I'm just saying, read along with me. Let's read this in unison. And as you read it, think about the world we're living in and see if maybe you might think we're in the last days. You may as well know this too, Timothy, that in the last days it's going to be very difficult to be a Christian. Boy, that's true, isn't it? For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be proud and boastful sneering at God, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful to them, and thoroughly bad. And Pam said, Amen. No, <laughs> no she wouldn't talk. They will be hard-headed and never give in to others. 
They will be constant liars and troublemakers and will think nothing of immorality. They will be rough and cruel and sneer at those who try to be good. They'll betray their friends. They'll be hot-headed, puffed up with pride, and prefer good times to worshiping God. They will go to church, yes, but they won't really believe anything they hear. Don't be taken in by people like that. I don't know, that kind of reads like the paper, doesn't it? You know, <laughs> and, and Paul says that's what it's going to be like in the last days. So, if Christ could come back at any moment, and if at least a lot of these symptoms of the last days are in our society today, what should be our response? How should we live in the light of the imminent return of Christ? I'm glad you asked that, because that's what I'm going to preach on today. Luke chapter 12, verse 35. Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning, like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth. He will dress himself to serve and will have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? The Lord answered, Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant, third time Jesus uses that phrase, whom the master finds doing so when he returns. I will tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all possessions. And then he goes on and basically says, and if the servant doesn't do what he was supposed to do, there's going to be a severe price to pay. Now, without getting bogged down in all of the possible and specific interpretations of this passage, the main lesson is pretty simple. You've already figured it out. Jesus is the master and we're the servants. Jesus has gone away. He says, I'm coming back. You've got to be ready. And so he has promised that he's going to return but he hasn't told us when. And so our responsibility is to be ready. Let's stand for closing prayer. No, you know there's still notes. <laughs> but that's the bottom line. Jesus says, I've gone away, just like this master. I'm coming again back, just like the master will. You don't know when, be ready. So what does he tell us to do? How should we be living in light of the imminent return of Christ. The first thing he says is stay alert. He says, first, be dressed and ready for service. It's kind of interesting. Be ready for service. Now, you know that in the first century, they wore robes, ankle-length robes. It was obviously cumbersome if you were trying to work, if you were trying to run, if you were in a battle. And so they wore a belt around their waist. It was about six inches wide. It was typically made of leather. It had clasps on it. And they would use it to carry the little money pouch that they had their money in. Uh, soldiers would use it to fasten their sword to themselves. But it was also used to, to keep your robe out of your way. They would, what they called back then, gird up their loins. They would pick that robe up and tuck it into their belt. And um, if you want something, I should not tell you to do this because you all have the internet and you'll be doing it while I'm preaching. But, but you can go home, you can go home and search, gird up your loins. And you'll actually find some artist's depiction of how what they did with that robe to kind of wrap it around themselves and tuck it up in their belt so that they were free to run or fight or work or whatever it is. But they called it girding up your loins. That's, you read that in the King James all the time, which is kind of a funny phrase. <laughs> but in the, in the King James, 
that what you, if you if you have other translations, it basically says be prepared or be ready because that's what it's talking about. There were times that it was used literally, and he, he literally meant get your robe up out of the way, tuck it into your belt because you're getting ready to fight or you're getting ready to work or whatever it is you needed to do. But it was also often used figuratively to mean be prepared. There's verses where he says, gird up your loins and be ready to give an answer. You know, in other words, he's saying, get ready, be prepared. And there were two more specific times when it was used. The first time is when a servant was ready to serve his master. When he would get up and there were, you know, he had his chores to do, his tasks for the do, for the day, he would gird up his loins. He would tuck that robe up in that belt, and it was a sign that he was alert and ready to do what he was called on to do. The New Testament writers use this concept to be alert and ready in light of the return of Christ. 1 Peter 1.13 says in the King James, gird up the loins of your mind. The NIV, prepare your minds for action. And if there was ever a time when Christians needed to use their minds, it's today. We have so much confusion and so much chaos in our world that we need people to use their brains. You know, God gave us one. We need to prepare our minds for action. We need to think and not just swallow everything that the media gives us. We need to think. In Ephesians six fourteen, talking about the armor of God, it talks about your loins gird about with truth, or the NIV, the belt of truth buckled around your waist. It's important that we have the word of God. And so when we're ready, when we're prepared for whatever God calls us to do, that's what he's saying. Gird up the loins. Make sure you're ready. Get everything out of the way. Make sure you're ready. The second time they would use that is when somebody went on a journey. When they're going on a long journey, you don't want your road dragging the dirty roads and the dusty roads. So they would pick it up out of the way, hook it onto that belt. It didn't matter how fancy that road was. didn't matter how much it cost. It's going to get in the way. It's going to trip you up. And uh, <laughs> you see these people, these guys walking down the sidewalk holding on to their pants because they got their pants so low it's tripping them up you know and they gotta they're the next time they do that roll down your window and holler you're girding up your loins and say, no, don't do that don't don't do that but that's what they're doing you know they're getting everything up out of the way so that you're going to do that aren't you <laughs> and then hit the gas real quick but but you know that, that that's kind of the picture that came out because that's what would happen if you're on a long trip you know, your robe is going to get in the way. It's going to trip you up. And so they would pull that up out of the way so they wouldn't trip and nothing would hinder them. And, you know, there's so much symbolism in this passage of Scripture today that, that, that I would say to you, you know, we're on a trip. We're on our way to heaven. Um, there may be some things tripping you up that you need to get up out of your way so that you can make it on to heaven. He says, be dressed, be ready for service, and keep your lamps burning. When I was thinking about that, I reflected back to Matthew 25 when Jesus told a similar parable about someone going away and they were going to meet the bridegroom, but half of them did not take oil with them and the lamps burned out. Here he says, make sure that you keep your lamps burning so that whenever the master comes back, you can open the door because you're ready for him and the lights are on and you're ready for his arrival. <coughs> Jesus said, let your light shine. First century lights did not shine without oil. Now, you probably know that in the Bible, oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And again, since there's so much symbolism in, in this passage that Jesus is teaching us, I think part of what he's telling us is make sure you stay connected to your supply. Make sure you've got plenty of oil. And for us, that's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that makes our light shine. It's his power working through us that makes it possible for us to be a light in a dark place. <coughs> What's interesting is when you, when you talk to people about the filling of the Spirit, people have all kinds of different ideas of what it means. But what's interesting is in the book of Acts, 
several times it says that the disciples were filled with the Spirit. Now, if you're filled, why do you need to be filled again? And if you got filled the second time, why do you need to be filled again? And, and the, in Ephesians 5.18, where Paul says, be filled with the Spirit, the literal translation of that is, keep on being filled with the Spirit. Why do we need to keep on being filled with the Spirit? I think there's at least two reasons. One is, as you walk with Christ, your capacity enlarges. You know, you, you know more about him. You're able to receive more of him. And as you grow in him, you need more of him to keep filled. But then secondly, I, I was thinking last night, I remember a story of a, of a prayer meeting where people were praying out loud and, and one man kept saying, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your spirit. And another man said, don't do it, Lord. He leaks. <laughs> Well, you know, we all leak, don't we? You know, and I think it's one of the reasons we need to keep filled with the Spirit, because we leak. Um, you know, in Hebrews chapter 2, it says, hold on to the things that you've heard, lest you let them slip. And one of those translations is like it leaks out like a leaky vessel. Now, there are a couple of reasons that we leak. I mean, sometimes we leak because of sin, but, but sometimes we leak just because of the pressures of this life. The, the, the spiritual energy that it takes to stay true to God in our world. You know, it's not as easy as it used to be. I remember decades ago, you know, back when every church had Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and if you were a real Christian, you were there all three times. And if they threw in another meeting, you were there too. And I remember an evangelist, that it, it, I mean, I was in college, maybe high school, and I heard him say, it used to be, that if I could get to church on Sunday morning, I could make it to next Sunday. But he said, a few years ago, I realized that's not enough. I've got to get there Wednesday because I'm about run out. You know, my spiritual energy is about gone. He said, I got to tell you now, I can barely make it from Sunday morning to Sunday night. But what he was saying was there's a reality to spiritual warfare. There's a reality to the pressures of living a Christian life in our society that drains your spiritual battery. And we need to keep our battery charged. You know? We need to keep the oil of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And often when you study the book of Acts, that's what had happened. They had had some kind of a challenge confronting them, and they needed a refilling of the Holy Spirit. So what Jesus is saying is, in light of the fact that I've gone away and I'm going to come back, but you don't know when, you make sure your minds are prepared, you make sure you're ready for service, you make sure your lamp is filled with oil and it keeps burning, and then he says, be watching. It will be good for those servants, verse 37, whose master finds them watching when he comes. Verse 38, it will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready even if he comes in the second or third watch. The second watch was 9 p.m. to midnight. The third watch, midnight to 3 a.m. The hard times to stay awake. He's saying, you don't know when I'm going to come back, but you got to be ready at a moment's notice. You need to have the lights on. You need to be watching for my coming because you don't know when it's going to happen. In Matthew 25, he says, watch therefore. You don't know the day or the hour when the Son of Man comes. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6, let us not sleep. Let us watch and be sober. Revelation 16, 15, I come as a thief. Blessed is he who stay awake. He says, if you knew when the thief was coming, you wouldn't have let your house be broken into. You know, he said, just be ready. You don't know when I'm coming. Be alert. Be ready. Have your mind engaged. Be active doing what he's called you to do. The third time he says it will be good for that servant is verse 43 whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Be active. Do what you were left here to do. And he said it will be good for that servant who is doing his job when the master comes back. He's saying this is the good manager. You've been put in charge of making sure everybody's got enough food, that the, the estate is running smoothly, and blessed is that man who when the master comes back, finds him busy 
doing what he's supposed to be doing. In Luke 19, verse 13, he says, Occupy till I come. The word occupy does not mean fill up space. It means do what you were left to do. God didn't leave us here on this earth just to fill up space. He gave us a job to do, didn't he? Go and make disciples. You will be witnesses of me. He left us a job to do, and it will be good for that servant if when the master returns, he finds us doing what he left us to do. And we know what he left us to do. He gave us the Great Commission in Matthew 28, go and make disciples. He said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you'll be my witnesses. He left us here in part to be his witnesses, to be an example in this world of what it means to live for Christ. I fear that a lot of times churches get involved in everything except the one thing God left us here to do, which is to tell others the good news of Jesus. That's our responsibility. That's why we're here. That's what we're to be active about. We're probably all, even those of us who are retired, are probably busier than we've ever been. I was talking to somebody a while back who retired, and she said, Ken, I have no idea how I got anything done while I was working. She said, I am so busy now. How did I get any of this done? And then she said, I guess probably it didn't get done. But, you know, I, you know I'm not going to ask you if you're busy. The question is, are we busy about our father's business? Are we busy doing what he left us here to do? This is not a call to quit your job. This is not a call to join a monastery. You know, this is not a call to be, you know, over in a corner somewhere doing nothing except praying and reading the Bible. It's a call to be doing what God left us here to do. And what he left us here to do was to be his witness wherever he has us, in our job site, in a school, in our neighborhood, with the people we do business with, everywhere we go, our job is to be a witness for him, to let other people know that God loves them, that he cares about them, and as the opportunity arises, to let them know how they can accept Christ into their life as well. He's coming back. We don't know when. Be ready. Be alert. Be watching. And be active. Be doing what he's called us to do. I, I heard about a man who, a uh, pretty wealthy guy, had nice estate, nice gardens and everything, and, and he left it in charge of his chief gardener. He said, I'm going around the world for a while. I don't know when I'll be back. You keep it up. And the man every day was out there consistently, faithfully, keeping that estate immaculate. And one day, a neighbor looked over the fence and he said, I've been watching you. You know, where's your boss? He's gone away. He said, well, man, he said, you are keeping this thing immaculate. You keep this thing like you're expecting your boss to come back tomorrow. And the man said, oh, no, sir. I expect him to come back today. That's how we're supposed to live in light of the imminent return of Christ. Like he may come back because he may come back today. He could come back at any time. He could come back before we get to the house. He could come back in another 10 years, but it could be at any moment. We need to be ready. And we need to be busy doing what he's called us to do. Be active doing the work of the Lord. One of the houses we lived in, um, the people who were there before us were apparently Christian. Because right beside the front door, and they left it there, whether accidentally or not, I don't know, but we left it up was a little cardboard placard that said, perhaps today. And it was just a reminder. That's the last thing you saw as you headed out the door, that maybe today is the day Christ comes back. Now, if we believed that and lived like that, it would make a difference, wouldn't it? Jesus says, I'm coming back soon. No, he doesn't. He said, I'm coming back at any moment. You don't know when it's going to be, so be ready. And while you're waiting and watching, be active, doing what I've left you here to do. Be the salt, be the light, be the witness to a God who loves us and will forgive us if we ask him. Maybe it'll be today. Father, help us to live with that awareness in mind. Not a fear, not an anxiety, but just an understanding that you are coming back. You said you would, and we don't know when. 
So help us to live, uh, as the old song says, with eternity's values in view. Let's set our affection on the things above. As we've talked over the last couple of weeks, make sure that our treasures are in heaven where moth and rust and corruption can't happen because our eternal inheritance is in heaven. So may we live with the anticipation that this might be the day, with the joy that this might be the day. And in the meantime, let us be active doing what you've left us here to do. Let us be lights in this darkness. Let us be the salt of the earth. Let us be people who encourage and lift up and brighten the lives of those around us because your light is shining through us. And Lord, I, I'm aware, as all of us are in this room, of, of the challenge uh, of living consistently for you in this society and not giving up our hope and not giving up our faith. So Lord, help us to keep our lamps filled with the oil of your Holy Spirit. Help us to keep in constant contact with you so that we are equipped for whatever comes our way. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you're coming back one of these days to receive us to yourself. We're looking forward to that day. It might be today, but if it's not, Lord, may we stay faithful to what you've left us here to do. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you and give you his peace now and evermore. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for coming out today. You're dismissed.